All right, I want to do a very quick video here um, answering a viewer question. They asked me, what do you do about if you've ever had a, a spiritual presence in your home and what do you do in that situation? And so I'm going to answer this from the Bible um, and it's actually a very simple answer, but I want to show you a couple different places where this has happened, where people have had uh, encounters with you know, God or an angel. Uh, Genesis chapter 15, verse 12, here's the first one that we're going to look at. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. So you see there, Abram actually was very, very afraid in the presence of God. Right? I'm going to show you the next one, Daniel, the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 10. Daniel 10, starting at verse 4. It says here, And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hydekel, then, then, you know, then I lifted up mine eyes, and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Euphaz. His body also was like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in collar to polished brass and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. And you see that thing. Every time there's a spiritual presence or something, it leads to fear with us as people. We get kind of cocky and kind of proud, and we think to the, ourselves, you know, if I'd ever see any kind of an angel or any, you know, anything like that, any kind of spiritual thing there, I wouldn't be afraid. People back then were super superstitious, and they, you know, uh, no, I think that you'd be quite afraid, like these guys were. But anyways, let's continue. Verse 8, Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me. For my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet, I, yet heard I the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. And behold, an hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. So even though he knows it's an angel, and he's, you know, the angel's commending him, he's still he's, he's, he's trembling, he's so afraid. Verse 12, then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. And when he had spoken such words unto me, I set my face toward the ground, and I became dumb. Did you ever get so scared that you can't even speak? I have. I'm going to tell you about that in just a minute or two here. Verse 16, And behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips, then I opened my mouth and spake, and said unto him that stood before me, O my Lord, by the vision my sorrows are turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. For how can the servant of this my Lord talk with this my Lord? For as for me, straightway there remaineth no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. Then there came again and touched me one like the appearance of a man, and he strengthened me, and said, O man greatly beloved, fear not, peace be unto thee, be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. So you see again there, this thing of this great fear and not even be, being able to speak because you're so afraid at a spiritual presence there. Go next to Revelation. Revelation chapter 1. This is not going to be a really huge in-depth study or anything here, but just going to hit a couple verses. Because like I said, the solution is actually very simple. Um, Revelation chapter 1 Verse 9, read down to verse 20. 
I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and be, being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. And it, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters." And he said, or excuse me, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Now, reading from the context there, this is obviously Jesus Christ. Now, it's interesting because what was John in relation to Jesus Christ? Jesus called him the disciple, you know, that he loved, basically. The disciple whom Jesus loved. It talks about actually there in the book of, of John. You know, so here he is. You know, one of the best friends that Jesus had on the earth. So you'd think John would be like, hey, Jesus, how you doing? You know, but look, look at his reaction here. Verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, fear not. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. That's how you know it was Jesus. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So that's when you get into the book of Revelation. So of course it's a very good book. But you see this thing there of spiritual, whenever a physical man comes into contact with the spiritual realm. And I realize these were all manifestations of the Lord or of an angel of God. These are all good spiritual manifestations, but even a good spiritual manifestation will lead you to intense amounts of fear, extreme fear, falling on your face, being like you're dead and just laying there, can't speak, you, you know, it's it's a bad thing. You know, it's, it's very scary. Our physical bodies are just not meant to are, are, we're not capable of really understanding the spiritual realm. Okay, in terms of we can't, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You know, we can't just go right over to that. We have to be changed. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you can read that. But let me ask you a question. We've been talking about good spirits. Okay, what about evil spirits? Can an evil spirit attack a Christian physically? We're talking about. Turn to Acts chapter 19. It's kind of a, a strange subject to talk about. There's not a whole lot of scripture on this I found in my research, but uh, here's a case of a spiritual being. And uh, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself here. Acts chapter 19, verse 13 through 16. It says here, Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are ye? Okay, so in other words, lost people can't use the name of Jesus right, to cast devils out of people. Now look what happens here. And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Did the evil spirit attack the men? Yes. Did the evil spirit attack the man just by itself? No. It had to have a physical body with which to work through. Let's see. So there you see that a spiritual being needs to have a physical body to attack somebody okay they can't just the, the spiritual being i don't know of any references in the bible where a spiritual being can attack 
somebody in the flesh, physically speaking. Okay? Now notice something very important in the next couple of verses here in Acts chapter 19. We have verses 17 through 20. Look at this. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling uh, at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. What were these deeds? Look at verse 19. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men, and they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. So what happens is these guys hear about this man that was possessed with devils attacking, physically attacking these Jewish exorcists. And what do they do? They go and they say, hey, I've been dabbling in the occult. Curious arts there. And brought their books together and burned them. All right. Now I'm going to tell you a little story about myself. A number of years ago, and I've said about, I think I've told this story in other sermons, but I'll just repeat it here again. A number of years ago, I was really heavy into researching and I was just researching anything I could, and I had bought a witch's encyclopedia. It was not, you know, I mean, it was a official witch's encyclopedia. And I had this thing, and uh, it was just like, I just didn't feel right having it, but it was like, boy, there's a lot of interesting things I can research in here, and I was really learning a lot, you know, reading this thing. But it was like the Lord just kept on, just kind of like, you really don't need that thing, Brian. You just, you know, shouldn't have that. And uh, one night I was laying there in my bed and I was, you know, just kind of going to sleep and just kind of a little bit tired. And um, I always kept my door shut to my bedroom, always kept it shut. And it wasn't locked, it just shut. I never liked to have my door cracked open even a little bit. It was always shut. And so, you know, I kind of was drifting in and out of sleep and I, I opened up my eyes the one time I looked over and the door is wide open. I'm thinking, why is my door wide open? It was shut, I know it, and I'm reasoning this, and while I'm reasoning it, something took that door and slammed that door shut hard enough to rip it off its hinges. And there wasn't anything in the room. And there were no windows open. You know, this was in the winter time. We did not have windows open in the house. And boy, you talk about fear. It just, it was just, I mean, I was scared to death. And I remember I, I could barely even speak. I was so frightened by that. You know, I could tell there was something in that room and I didn't know what to do. And finally I got the name Jesus out. And as soon as I said Jesus, I could feel things changing in the room. And I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, get out of here. And then I started to get more bold. I said, Lord Jesus Christ, whatever that thing is, get it out of here. And whatever it was left didn't bother me anymore. And so I, Lord really convicted me at that point and I took that occult book and I burned it. All right. And that's the right thing to do, by the way, if you have one, burn it. Okay. That's what they did there in the book of Acts. So, uh, time went by and I was again, you know, just, uh, uh, going to bed the one night and I don't know what this event was because, you know, I wasn't really messing around with the cult type of stuff at that time, but uh, there was another night and I had a fan. It was summertime and, and the room I was sleeping in would always get really hot, even with air conditioning, didn't matter. And I had a fan that was sitting about four feet away from my bed, big like 20 inch box fan, and the thing would blow on me there while I was sleeping. And I remember this one night I was laying there and all of a sudden it was like the fan just really, really sped up fast, like that, like something was blowing it, and this horrible smell, really, really, really foul odor came through that fan. And again, I felt that evil presence in the room. And again, I had a hard time speaking, but I got the name Jesus out, and it was just like, it was gone. Problem solved, you know. And um, I had a couple different times where you know, I'd be in this room, and the, and the, the house that I was living in had been a, uh, there was a, a heavy metal singer that had lived there before me, and um, they had some very, very wild, you know, parties, and uh, 
neighbors would tell us about that and so where I was living down in Pennsylvania it was it was a bad place and so the Lord only knows what happened there but the, the point is I still to this day don't know exactly what all happened and another time I was sleeping and I, I just kind of woke up a little bit and I felt something actually like a hand touching me on my side and again you know fear and and that time I actually when I said Jesus and the fear started to leave I actually prayed Lord if that is some kind of a curse or some kind of a witchcraft thing or somebody doing one of these you know out of the body type of things I, I mean I really don't know about all that stuff but whatever it is I said Lord if this is some kind of curse send it back to them and you make them wish that they had never sent it so I have had a few experiences in the spiritual realm like that and uh, I'm going to tell you how to fix that here in just a minute okay we're going to go to uh, excuse me Philippians the book of Philippians chapter 2 I'm going to show you why the name of Jesus has such power to it Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 we'll start there and read down to verse 11 it says here let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, look at verse 10, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Okay, now our evil spirits, if these were evil spirits that were attacking me or whatever, uh, are they um, in heaven, in things in earth? Things, well, things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth? Yeah, they would qualify. Okay? Everything in the universe has to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's God. That's the way it is. And the spirit realm is a lot more obedient when it comes to listening to the name of Jesus. You know, man has a free will, and most men choose to reject the Lord Jesus Christ, at least while they're here on earth. Someday they will bow the knee to the Lord Jesus and confess that he is God. So, well, Lord to the glory of God, but that he's God as well. We go to Ephesians chapter 6. Of course, these ought to be familiar verses to you, but, you know, I have to always remember that there are people that are newly saved and really kind of unfamiliar with some of this stuff. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18 says here, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You know, stand against the wiles of the devil. Look at verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints." What is the last action that you do before you go to bed at night? If you're being attacked spiritually, what is the last thing that you're doing before you go to sleep? Well, right there is a good thing. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the, in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. My wife and I now, since we've been married, we have been praying for the saints. Last thing that we do before we go to sleep, we pray. Spend our last few moments there in prayer before we finally say, okay, time to go to sleep. That's a good thing to do. And um, I can tell you that um, in the time that we've been doing that, there have been no spiritual attacks. None of these weird spirits entering the room and whatever else, it's just not there. 
and we have Bibles everywhere and we're listening to the right kind of music and we're, you know, our conversation is right. And there again, you know, I didn't really say about that, but the fact of the matter is when some of these spiritual attacks were happening, there were some sins in my life I was messing around with. I wasn't really as sanctified as I should have been at that point in time. So it's very important to keep yourself um, in good, strong fellowship with the Lord. Because when you are not in good fellowship with the Lord, you open yourself up to spiritual attacks. All right. One other place to turn to here. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. I apologize for some of the cutting in and out here with this camera. I'm, I'm kind of experimenting here with this camera for a short video like this. It's a different camera than my normal one. Um, but it says uh, here in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even, even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Look at verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Who's the him? Who's the his? The word of God. So if you want to have a guard in your room to protect you from things that are evil, evil spiritual forces or whatever, right there. The Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. The Holy Spirit can be there basically with you. And I want to tell you something. I've had um, some young men that have written and they say about how that they have very, very horrible dreams sometimes, um, very perverse dreams, and you wake up and you're going, I didn't want to dream that, you know, that's horrible. I don't want to think these things. I don't want to wake up with that stuff in my mind. You know, what do I do? And uh, my advice to you is, and my advice that I've given to others on that subject is, um, I'm a real big fan of Alexander Scorby recordings of the King James Bible being read. And I've had different times where I've had some really horrible dreams. And what I've done is I actually will take uh, an Alexander Scorby, you know, put it on MP3 player, and then have little speakers there or whatever, and I'll put that thing on while I'm, when I'm going to bed. Of course, pray and everything. Make sure you're confessed up with the Lord. But you put that MP3 or on there and you play it very low. So you can hear it, but it's not going to keep you awake. And then you play the Bible. You know, pick a good book of the Bible where it's going to be, you know, going for quite a, a ways. And you play the Bible softly. And I have found that that will clear up a lot of the spiritual problems that are going on. Okay, why? The Holy Spirit speaking through that recording. It's the Word of God being read. And you fill your room, you fill, fill the atmosphere with that, and um, the Lord will protect you. And uh, I, you know, one of the problems with, with Christians today, all Christians, Bible believers I'm talking about, we tend to think um, uh, too scientifically. Okay? Um, science has its limitations. Okay, all things are not in this world, in this universe. We can't test everything and observe everything and demonstrate everything. Um, real true science has its limitations. And when you start hitting the supernatural realm, there's nothing you can do scientifically about that. But when you hear things at night or when you see things happening or doing, a lot of us try to think of that scientifically. And we try to answer it scientifically. Well, maybe I just had some bad pizza or something like that. That's why I had that weird dream or maybe this or maybe that. We oftentimes forget the fact that there are spiritual forces out there that want to attack us. And you have to fight spiritual forces with spiritual weapons like the Word of God. So if you're having problems with spiritual things, first of all, if you have occult books, get rid of them, burn them. Okay? If you have satanic heavy metal or rock or something like that, things where they're openly satanic, you know, get it out of your place. Burn it. Get it gone quickly. Um, secondly, spend your time in prayer before you go to bed. Thirdly, keep the Word of God by your bed there. If you're having problems with dreams, if you're having problems with spiritual things attacking you, play the Word of God. All right? So hopefully that answers the question. And, uh,
I guess that's it. Thank you very much for watching.